Okay, if you have your Bible with you, um, you might want to open to Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4. It's printed for you in your bulletin. There's an outline with all the scripture verses in the bulletin. The verses are going to be up on the, up on the screen as well. Um, but we print them in the bulletin too because if you can't get your bifocals adjusted just right, you can always look in your bulletin to see the verses of scripture that we're going to look at. And the reason we do that is because the most important thing that happens today is the scripture. It's not the fluff that I put in. It's actually the word of God that is the most important thing that happens. And if you don't get anything else, we want you to at least get the verses of scripture. So today is Father's Day and we've taken a moment earlier to honor our dads and dads. We really are glad that you're here today. And today the title of the lesson is a reality check for dads. A reality check. I just want us to be reminded as dads what kind of world it is that we've brought our kids into. I want us to get a real view of the world and the enemy and the circumstances into which our kids have come and those circumstances in which we must raise them. And so we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start with verse number 4. This is probably one of the most familiar verses on fatherhood in the whole book. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus. Particularly, he speaks in this verse to the men who are fathers. And he says this, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. That word exasperate just means to unnecessarily make them mad. You get that? It's it's not just your job to make them mad. It's your job to give them instruction so that their behavior can conform to the behavior that is God's will for them. Now, sometimes in the process of doing that, you will make them mad, and that's okay. It's not your job to be their buddy, but it is your job to be their father. Don't unnecessarily exasperate your children, but instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up, not let them come up, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, you know what's going to happen in this room in the next few moments. You know that you may choose to break the hearts of some dads. But Lord, often you've got to break our heart so that you begin, can begin to do in us what you want to do in us. And Lord, if that's what you want to do today, so be it. Father, you may want to encourage some dad today to just keep on keeping on even though it's tough. Lord, Lord you may want to, to cause some dad to just repent and say, I got to change what I've been doing for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of my children. So Lord, whatever your will is today, we just ask you to do that. Take your word and use it to bring about life change. And every one of us, because I ask that in Jesus' name and for his sake, and amen. Amen. So last week I reminded you that Malachi was the final prophet of the Old Testament. Because you see, Father's Day, fatherhood, is so important that I couldn't say everything that I think needed to be said in one Sunday sermon, so I'm giving you two. We got one last week, and we're getting one today about fatherhood. And I reminded you in that first sermon, Malachi was the final prophet of the Old Testament, and in his prophecy, he wrote these words referring to the ministry of John the Baptist. Now, here's how important fatherhood is. It's so important that in the Old Testament, God got the attention of the people of Israel by telling them that somebody was going to come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He was going to prepare the way of the Lord. And the primary goal of his ministry was to turn the hearts of fathers to children and the hearts of children to their fathers. So he predicted that ministry back in the Old Testament. And then John the Baptist came as a fulfillment of that prophecy in the New Testament. Look what Malachi wrote in Malachi 4, 6. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And I told you last week that if fathers fail in their responsibility as fathers in any generation, we are subject to a global curse from God. And I think we can see that maybe we're in the midst of some of that today. According to Luke's account of the gospel, the angel of the Lord told Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, that his son, John, would be the fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. Luke wrote that in Luke chapter 1, uh, some excerpts from verses 13 down to 17. This is what, what Luke wrote. The angel said to him, this is to Zacharias, 
Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. I wish I had time to tell you that whole story and how that all played out, but, but the angel appears when John is in the, in the tabernacle and he's, he's doing the work of the priest, burning incense there on the altar of incense, and, 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 and an angel shows up, and, and John is, I mean, Zechariah is old, and Elizabeth is old, and they've given up on being able to ever have children, and then an angel shows up and said, this is going to happen. You're going to have a son, and you're going to call him John, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the the Lord their God. He will also go before him, meaning the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, in order for John to get the people of the first century ready for what the Lord wanted to do in and through them, then the hearts of fathers had to be turned to the children. And listen, I want you to understand this. If we want revival in America today, if we want God to come in and do a sweeping work across this great country because of the church and its stand for the Lord and the light that we're supposed to be, if that's going to happen, the first thing that has to precede that is hearts of fathers have to be turned to their children, not to their fishing boat, not to trips to the lake, not to bowling, not to whatever sport it may be or whatever hobby you have. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with all that, but if that takes precedence over your responsibility to your children, then yes, that is wrong. We just got to understand that. Hearts of fathers turned to children, and then, and then he would turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and he would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The primary purpose of the ministry of John the Baptist, according to both the prophet Malachi and the angel of the Lord, was to turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Failure of fathers to turn their hearts toward their children and the failure of children then to turn their hearts toward their fathers will result in God deciding to come and strike the earth with a curse. That's pretty, pretty serious business, isn't it? So fatherhood is a serious issue. The most significant undertaking of any father whose heart has been turned to his children was described by Paul when he wrote those words that we read at the beginning in Ephesians chapter 6, 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I want to say this. There has never been a more urgent need for American fathers to fully assume this responsibility than in this second decade of the 21st century. I mean, listen to the news. Look around you. See what's going on in America and understand that there uh, has been a war declared on your children. That the enemy wants to destroy the hearts and the minds of your children. The enemy knows that if he can control your children, he can control the destiny of the next generation. And so there has never been a time that it's more urgent for fathers to do exactly that. I want to tell you this. America is a dangerous place to raise children today. It's a dangerous place to raise children today. The America into which today's children are born has become a very, very dangerous place. It has changed tremendously in only one generation. Those of you who, like me, are 60 years of age or older know that when you were young, the culture reinforced positive values and attempted to help parents raise their children with biblical morals and values. Even unchurched people had biblical morals and values. They might not live it out every day, but they at least had a good, solid understanding of what was moral and what was immoral, what was healthy and what was unhealthy, what was good and what was bad. We have lost that in one generation today. Now... The culture is at war with parents. It's very difficult to get kids safely through the minefield of adolescence. And we're seeing a relentless attack on childhood today. There are many people in influential, politically active organizations who literally hate the Judeo-Christian system of morality and values that you and I believe if we believe the Bible. They realize that if they can gain control of our children, they can change the entire culture in one generation, and they have just about done it. That's why there's such a flood 
of anti-Christian propaganda being pumped into our culture, much of which is aimed directly at our children through the curriculum endorsed by the National Education Association and taught in many U.S. public schools. Most parents have absolutely no idea what their kids are being taught at school. And those kids spend more hours in a day being influenced by people in the classroom at the school than they do being influenced by you. We need to know what they're being taught so we can counter anything that is destructive to them emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And we can counter that with the Word of God. So here's what I want to do. I want you to understand the dad, it is crucial for you to take seriously this command of Moses. It kind of echoes what Paul already told us, but Moses wrote this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. He wrote, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. I want you to get that. First, they got to be in your heart. Then what? Then you teach them to your children. He's talking primarily here to dads. In the first century in Israel, when a public statement was made, it was almost without, section, without exception directed toward the men. Very little instruction was given to the women. Sorry, girls, that's just the way it was. This was talking to the men. And what does he say here? Guys, first you've got to get it in your heart, and then you can teach it to your children. You can't teach something you don't know. You can't give something you don't have. So first you have to get it in your heart, and then you can teach them diligently to your children. And then he tells us how to do that. It should just be in the routine of life. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. What's he saying? Just in the routine of life. When you're sitting at home, and, and, and discussion comes up about some issue in the culture, then tell them what the Word of God has to say about that. When you get up in the morning, talk to them about issues that might confront them through the day. Tell them what the Word of God says about that. When you're on a trip and you're walking by the way, talk to them about issues that you see in life that are going on. And tell them what the Bible says about that. One of the things that Miss Jenny and I said to her kids when they were growing up a lot was we didn't try to keep them in a bubble and, and not have them exposed to what the real world was about. But when we saw things going on that were inappropriate, that were not biblical, that were not moral, we would point that out to them and say, some people do this, but we don't do this because of what God says. Some people may, but we don't. Do you understand that? Our kids need to know that. They need to know just because some people do it doesn't mean we're going to do it because we believe what God says. Here's what I want to give you. I want to give you a few examples. A few examples of things in our culture that routinely confront our children and that we need to be able to give them God's answers to these things. I'm just going to give you a few. And I want to, I want to tell you that these things have been going on for at least the last 20 years. For the last 20 years... Our kids have been under a direct assault from the public sector. You see, on February the 1st, 2002, the National Education Association announced a new policy to be disseminated to schools all over the country, urging every school district to teach children of all ages what amounts to propaganda to legitimize homosexual behavior. To make that a, an acceptable alternative lifestyle. News of the NEA's policy directive was first published by, uh, in the national media in an article printed on February the 8th, 2002, in the Associated Press. And it was under the title, because you see, in, in most liberal news outlets, the title is very misleading. The title is often not a real reflection of what the content of the article is about. Have you ever noticed that? And, and that's what happens here. Um, they, they published it under the title, The NEA, the National Education Association, approves a resolution to protect gay, lesbian, bisexual students and staff. That's not what the article was all about. 
The Constitution of the United States already protects the rights of every citizen. Do you understand that? It protects the rights of every citizen. What this was about was giving special rights to that group of people. That's what that was really about. So the normalization of, of same-sex sexual behavior has been promoted in the U.S. public schools for almost two decades now under the guise of protecting the rights of people who have chosen a lifestyle that becomes addictive and that is destructive and that is harmful to them. They've chosen that lifestyle. And, and, and should they be protected from violence and bullying and stuff? Absolutely. But the Constitution and state laws already do that. This was to normalize that kind of behavior and say, this is acceptable. This is good. They're no different than you are when they are because of a set of choices that they have made. Get that? Can I, can I, can I, say, can I say that? In the culture, in any culture, there are subsets of people in that culture, and those subsets most often are determined by the accumulative results of the choices that we have made. Is that not true? Not, not just in the, in the gay and lesbian culture, but, and I'll say this because, you know, I love you, I'm not bashing you, but many of you who have been put in the subset of addicts, why are you there? Because of the series of choices that you have made. Now let me ask you this. Do you have to stay there? Absolutely not. You can become a new creature in Christ. You can change that. You can be something different than you were before. So can other subsets of people. But it's a reality. They're there. And, and the idea that this subset doesn't exist, that that's just the way things are, and that they are not responsible for those actions, is what is being pumped into the minds of children today in the public school system. Thank God, in rural America where we live, most of the public schools have enough Christian influence still in them because there are Christian administrators and Christian teachers that a lot of that is kind of dulled down but it's in the curriculum. And so we just need to be grateful for where we live. Now, in case you think that no state legislature would ever move to implement such curricula in the public schools, then think again. <laughs> because in late 2002 and early in two, er, 2003, the California legislature passed a series of bills designed to implement the NEA's policy directives into the public schools. They made it law. It wasn't no longer just a... A, just a recommendation, just a directive by the NEA who didn't have the power to enforce it. Now it's become law in California. And when children came back to school from their summer vacation in September of 2003, what was waiting for them was California's version of social engineering curricula promoted by the NEA. And following California's lead... 21 other states and the District of Columbia have passed legislation to implement measures to normalize homosexual behavior in their public schools under the rationale of protecting the rights of gay, lesbian, and bisexual students and staff. I mean, that's going on. Then should we wonder why so many young people are buying into that? It's what they're being taught. And dad, it is your responsibility to counter that with the word of God. By showing them the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. By showing them clear statements that God makes in scripture regarding that lifestyle. Now having said all of that, does that mean we gay bash? Does that mean we mistreat people who have bought into that lifestyle? And they just believe the devil's lie because they didn't know any better? Do we bash them? Do we mistreat them? Absolutely not. We love them enough to speak the truth and love to them. Because the only way they're going to get free from the bondage of that lifestyle is to know the truth. John said it in John 8, 32. You shall know the truth. And what will happen? The truth will set you free. So, you know, sadly, sadly, the majority of parents 20 years ago either didn't know, because let's face it, sometimes we live with our head in the sand. They either didn't know, they didn't bother to get informed, or they didn't care. Because this kind of legislation has routinely passed with little resistance. My question is, where were the dads? Where were the moms? But particularly, where were the dads whom God has made responsible for the protection of their children's moral and spiritual well-being? There should have been a huge outcry when this was being proposed. All of this, in spite of the fact that when God wrote a civil law 
for the nation of Israel, his chosen nation. He wanted what was best for them, so he wrote their law. This is what he declared. It's in Leviticus chapter 20, verse number 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death and their blood shall be upon them. Does God take that thing seriously? Does that sound to you like God wants to normalize same-sex behavior? Sounds to me like it's a capital crime as far as God is concerned. And so we certainly want to counter the lie of the devil in that regard when our children are being confronted with it. On February the 14th, 2002, Valentine's Day, right? February the 14th, 2002, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell appointed by President George W. Bush, appeared on MTV and recommended that kids use condoms. Isn't that wholesome information to be giving youngsters, early teens, teenagers? He recommended that. I want to read you a portion of, of his quote. Listen carefully to what he said. He said, forget about taboos. Forget about conservative ideas. The lives of young people are at risk by unsafe sex. Therefore, protect yourself. Use a condom. What Secretary Powell didn't tell his young viewers is that there is no safe sex outside of a marriage relationship in, with, in which both partners are committed to monogamy. And just in case you don't know that word, it means one man, one woman, one lifetime. There's no safe sex outside of that. The Centers for Disease Control issued a report in early 2001, barely even noticed by the liberal media that said this, there is no evidence that condoms protect against syphilis, gonorrhea, human papilloma, virus, herpes, AIDS, and most other sexually transmitted diseases. You get that? No evidence that condoms provide for safe sex. And yet, the U.S. Secretary of State gets up and tells a nationwide viewership of young people, it's okay, just use a condom. No wonder sexually transmitted diseases have reached epidemic levels in America in the last generation. During the past 19 years, countless lives have been irreparably damaged because they believed the safe sex lie. However, we shouldn't be surprised because the one who inspires all lies wants to destroy all lives. Jesus said it like this in John 10.10. 10, the thief, referring to Satan, the guy who is the father of lies, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. We shouldn't be surprised. So here's the conclusion. The latest lie, the latest lie the enemy is telling the current generation of young adults in America is that it is okay to break the civil law by violence, theft, assault, arson, and even murder as a means of protesting what you consider racial injustice. I mean, that's right in front of our eyes, isn't it? Many young adults have believed that lie in spite of the fact that the scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. The Greek word translated ordinance there in this verse literally means a law designed to set norms of behavior. Now in every country, in the United States, in every state, and in, in, in each state, in every county, and in each county, in every municipality, there are laws that have been passed by the authorities that are designed to create a norm of behavior. One of those norms of behavior across the board is don't steal. So when you're involved in a riot and you loot and you steal, you're breaking that law. And the scripture says that we're supposed to submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. But we won't excuse that by saying racial injustice. Does racial injustice exist? Absolutely. When the white police officer 
<laughs> murdered George Floyd? Was that racial injustice? Yes, probably so. But are we supposed to handle that by rioting and stealing? Violence? Killing people? Burning down businesses? Are we supposed to handle it that way? No, we have a court system to handle that. The courts ought to handle that. And the man who did it should be fired. He should be charged. He should be uh, tried and found guilty and then executed. I mean, that's just right out of the scripture. That's what ought to happen. You handle that through the court system, not through the mayhem that is taking place in America today. What a teaching opportunity for our children. Dads, when they see it on the news, what an opportunity to say, it's not that these are bad people, it's that these people are ignorant of what God says is the proper way to handle their grievance. You get that? What a great opportunity for a dad to do that and begin to build the word of God into the lives of his children. I could go on and on, but let me close by saying that there can be no question that there is an urgent need for the fathers of our day to rally around the same challenge that Moses issued to the fathers of Israel in his day. And this one is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, some excerpts from verses 1 and 2. Moses said, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe. Teach you to just obey these laws. And then he tells them why God told him to teach them to obey these laws. And these are the laws of God in Scripture. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live. And so that you may enjoy long life. You see, when we teach our children to obey the commands of God and we build that into their lives, the natural result is the fear of the Lord. Teach your children to fear God. And then what will happen? Then they can live and enjoy a long life. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But the key to that is dad. The key to that is fathers stepping up and taking their responsibility to teach their kids. And if you're doing that, my heart goes out to you. My hat goes off to you. And, and, if, and if you're in a situation right now where you can't do that, but you want to do that and you plan to do that, as soon as you get in the situation where you can, God bless you. But making a decision because you have heard this presented from the word today is not going to get the job done. You're going to have to follow through with the decision. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever in the heat of a, of a sermon and you were really convicted and you made a decision and you said, I'm going to do that. And two years later, you still hadn't done it. Are you with me? Yeah. This one needs follow through. This one needs some follow through.